I'm very happy to be here. I'm a great fan of enhanced recovery. I spent a year, this is one of my acknowledgements, working with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement in the US as a quality improvement fellow, um, thinking a lot about in, um, standardization, reducing variation. And I think, as you all know, that's absolutely key and central to enhanced recovery. I'd also like to acknowledge my ELPQUIC study colleagues, and I'll tell you about ELPQUIC uh, in this talk, um, particularly my colleagues from the Royal Surrey Hospital, where Mike is, um, and the other colleagues who've worked with me on this program, and to the Health Foundation for its support in my quality improvement work and for the ELPQUIC study support. IRAS for emergency general surgery, well, Mike has alluded to some of the problems. So can it be done and do we need it? Well, I've been interested in outcomes for, for, of emergency general surgical patients for a very long time, um, since the early 90s probably, when as a senior junior doctor I did an audit and I was absolutely appalled at the mortality. I was seeing mortalities of around 40% in patients and yet nobody was talking about it, and there was no research. Um, in 2011, my colleagues and I published a study in the European Journal which of emergency laparotomy, 125 consecutive patients, and that showed an average mortality of 17.5%. Began this very high mortality in the over 80s. This is 30 day of 40%. Uh, the editorial that accompanied this, patient, uh, this paper said, well, it's an interesting study, but it's a small one hospital study. We need some bigger studies. Um, I then went off to the US, thought about how we might improve outcomes for these patients, came back and had a chat with a guy called Dave Murray at a meeting. And then with three other colleagues, the five of us founded a network because there was a huge amount of interest out there in this problem. Um, we called it the Emergency Laparotomy Network UK. Uh, we, we wanted to set up a resource for spread of ideas and good practice to attract champions and collect data. We then published this paper that you've already seen, um, which showed high variation and again a high mortality. The mortality in this paper, 1,800 patients from 35 NHS hospitals, um, prospective for observational study, showed 14.9% overall mortality, so coming down a little bit from our earlier paper, but again, this very high mortality of 24.4% in the over 80s at 30 days. Now compare that with the sort of mortality where we're doing fine tuning um, on other case types, like esophagectomy, gastrectomy, where we think these are relatively high risk cases. I mean, it's hugely different. The Emergency Laparotomy Network also gave us some other useful data. It showed, again, as Mike alluded to, this variation, and variation means there's room for improvement. As you get sicker, the likelihood of you having a consultant anesthetic or surgical presence goes down, and it goes down through the day, evening, and night as well. We know that there's good evidence to use uh, goal-directed fluid therapy, but in this group of patients um, from these 35 interested hospitals, remember this was voluntary reporting, only 15% of patients had goal-directed fluid therapy, so more room for improvement. And only one-third approximately, uh, sorry, two-thirds went to a high dependency or critical care bed, but one-third went to a ward bed. That was followed up uh, my first paper, remember, 2011, uh, 2012, our emergency laparotomy paper, and also this paper from the NSKIP database in the US of 37,500 patients undergoing emergency laparotomy, showing a 30-day mortality of 14%. So it seems this is a pretty universal problem. And that paper suggested the variables most associated with death were age, ASA status, functional status, and sepsis. You've seen this paper already from Omar Faiz's group. Again, the variation. This is a HESS database study. Um, the mortality, 15.6%, so we're pretty much around this 14, 15% mark, with this variation of 9 to 18%. 
And in that study, again, there was these high and low mortality outlier hospitals. And the, the differentiation or the association with good outcome correlated with higher number of ICU and HDU bed resources and use of CT scanning, independent predictors of reduced mortality. So here again, we've got some variation which we could hone down on and work to improve if we want to make care better. Again, finally, the evidence that we've all got a problem. This is a Danish study uh, that you will, probably many of you will be aware of, published in the BJA just last month. Overall mortality of these patients, 18.5%, 24% at 90 days, 84% of patients sent to a ward. And this paper called for a multidisciplinary approach with involvement of both surgeons and intensivists and future studies which should focus on improving risk stratification and triage and the effect of post-operative intermediate care optimized post-operative protocols. So hopefully I'll show you a little bit of how we've been doing some of that work already in the UK. As we've heard from other speakers, in this group of pati patients, mortality is huge. You can't ignore it. But remember, mortality is just the tip of the iceberg. In high-risk patients, not just this group of patients, the vast majority of complications are occurring in the high-risk patients. So 80 to 90% of your cardiac, renal, and pulmonary complications in the highest-risk patients, of which the emergency laparotomy patients will be almost the highest risk. This is um, something we presented last year at the Association of Surgeons. We looked at 146 consecutive laparotomy patients, and we found that the complication rate of the whole group was 62%, but the over 80s had a significantly higher uh, risk of complications. And they were particularly having cardiac complications. And when we looked at the time course of that, it was particularly atrial fibrillation on day three. So even if you did get to a critical care bed, you were then sent back to a ward bed uh, just as you were getting your uh, cardiac complication. And for the patients in the audience, this isn't a complication, this is Jim. And for those of you who are surgeons particularly, uh, you will know that a, an emergency surgical complication can be pretty awful for the patient and for the surgical team. Uh, it's not nice having an anastomotic breakdown or a leak. And using patient stories is a very effective way of achieving change. If you want to implement the kind of changes that I'm going to show you, tell a patient's story. People stop arguing and start doing. And I've just put a couple of really good resources on there for those of you that are interested in this. So we've got a big problem with emergency laparotomy. What can we do? And Dave Saunders in our emergency laparotomy paper wrote that we can't change the patient's age, their comorbidity, or the underlying pathology, but the way the processes of care is provided may be varied. And prompt assessment, early resuscitation, timely access to theater, senior staff involvement, and appropriate levels of post-operative care are all potentially modifiable factors. And those are the things that we saw significant variation in, in our study and in other studies. So just as an example, this is Ghaffari's paper from the New England Journal of Medicine, showing that low and high mortality surgical hospitals were not different in their incidence of complications, but in, their, in the way they rescued patients. So if you rescued patients effectively from a complication, you made a difference to surgical mortality. So that's one thing that could be done, better rescue. And Ghaffari and colleagues suggested that there's this domino of complication that leads to death. And high mortality hospitals are not as effective in rescuing patients once they develop a complication. And having spoken to that group, it, it's not about rescuing necessarily when the patient is in trouble on the ward. It might be about putting them in somewhere in a critical care unit when you can, where you can rescue immediately. So two things that I think are outstanding for this group of patients. Reduce variability and increase reliability. Sounds exactly like elective enhanced recovery to me. 
And Don Abedian, in one of those seminal papers on quality improvement, talk about structure, process, and outcome. And those are the things I think you can look at to try to improve emergency surgical patient outcomes. I think also measuring outcome. We've shown you the data. There was very little out there prior to 2011 or so about these outcomes. Now there's been more and more papers which are creating that burning platform for change. I think you need the will. We've now got the will. There's a big problem here. You need some ideas about what you're going to do. You need to have the capacity to understand how you make those ideas achieve change. And that all fits together in the science of improvement or quality improvement, if you like. I wrote about um, a driver di diagram, just thinking about how you structure your actions. And again, it's very systematic, very much like the way enhanced recovery works. It's very easy to break down our thoughts into these areas. Where are we going to work? We could work in any of these areas to improve outcome, decrease mortality, complications, and cost. And I think something that particularly the surgeons are talking about is service organization. Who is it that's going to be doing these patients' operations? Is it a breast surgeon that normally doesn't do um, elective colorectal? Why then would they be doing the really the sickest patients? So they, these are all things that we have to think about to try to improve outcomes. So I very much like this diagram taken from this paper in the American Journal of Surgeons suggesting that um, on this side, on the left, on your left side, um, our traditional approach is we have a diagnostic delay, then we have an operative delay while we wait for the CT scan. There hasn't been a sense of urgency about dealing with these patients. We then take them to theatre. We use vasopressors to keep their blood pressure up. We put them in ICU, wait for the multi-organ failure and possibly the early death. And we need to change that around and create a real sense of urgency, managing these patients differently, thinking differently about the surgery, active ICU admission with ongoing resuscitation. So you may have seen this diagram before. I use it a lot, originally from Terry Borman um, at the Mayo Health System about how, and I know that this is not about enhanced recovery, about how often we all work as doctors in our variable autonomous way. And if we can standardize care, we know that it can improve outcome. It certainly makes it easier to measure and we can then work on areas to improve. It's a bit like, um, sorry, I'll come back to that. So we know that um, we need to improve outcome and myself, Dilip Lobo, and some other uh, colleagues wrote some standards for care in this document on the high-risk general surgical patient. What we did in this, uh, this document was just to put down some simple things that we thought we should do to standardize a pathway of care for the higher-risk surgical patient, not just emergency laparotomy, but it works for emergency laparotomy. It looks very much like an enhanced recovery pathway. In fact, I would say it really is an enhanced recovery pathway which you can adapt for emergency surgery. So it's a bit like daydreaming as a cat herder, thinking I'd rather manage a large software development project, trying to get in standard practice all your different types of surgeons, some of whom are not colorectal surgeons, anaesthetists without an interest, all doing different things into organizing their pathways to make it look a little bit more like this, where you've got your cats lined up and you know what people are going to do, you know what should be happening at set steps of the pathway. So putting a theory into practice, um, we, with the Royal Guildford, Royal Devon and Exeter, and uh, Torbay and Torquay Hospital, my hospital in Bath, um, borrowing ideas which had been tested at the Royal Surrey, I added some quality improvement input to it, and we developed a care bundle, which we called the Emergency Laparotomy Pathway Quality Improvement Care Bundle, because ELP Quick sounded quite good in these four hospitals. So what is it? Well, we focused on early assessment and resuscitation, with an early warning score within 30 minutes of arrival and key actions that were supposed to happen based on the early warning score. 
early antibiotics, particularly within one hour if there's evidence of SIRS, prompt diagnosis and early surgery, and certainly in Bath we came up with the co uh, concept of code emergency laparotomy, which I think we'd borrowed or stolen from Guildford possibly, um, goal-directed fluid therapy and post-operative critical care bed for everyone. Now except we have very low critical care bed uh, in Bath, probably one of the lowest in the UK, but it's this concept that everybody should be going to critical care that changes our way of thinking about those patients. So the pre-operative phase is these three components, assessment, early antibiotics, prompt diagnosis. Um, Intraoperative is then goal-directed fluid therapy and getting to surgery early. And what we said was from decision to surgery uh, should be within six hours. So when the surgeon makes the decision to enter the operating theatre, should be within six hours. And that accounts for that semi-urgent group of patients, the ones you're managing conservatively. It's when you decide that they need theatre, then they need to be there within six hours. And then this concept of post-operative intensive care for everyone. Each hospital was allowed to implement this pathway in their own way. So this is the top down, bottom up. So we had the ideas, but the nurses, the people at the front line could implement in their own way. My junior surgical colleagues came up with this concept of a laparotomy boarding card. You didn't get booked into theatre until you ticked off some key components, which included having your P possum assessed so we could see what your likelihood of morbidity and mortality was. So overall, um, we had some baseline data, 319 patients, and then we implemented, this is a quality improvement project, so it's iterative. We were changing it as we went along. Um, each, as I say, each hospital could make changes, but we came together on a regular basis and shared the data. 30-day mortality came down across all hospitals. It was not significant, raw mortality was not significant overall, but it was if we took the higher risk group of the 75-year-olds and over. We improved our process measures in nearly all areas, and you can see that none of us were very good to begin with, um, but in decision to theatre in less than six hours, everybody improved. Consultant anaesthetist in theatre, Everybody improved, although Site 3 was already very good. Intraoperative goal-directed fluid therapy. Now, remember, this is four hospitals who are really interested in emergency patient outcomes, and yet we weren't very good when we started. We're a lot better now, but there's still room for improvement. Post-operative ITU, everybody improved. And if you look at it as um, things that areas for improvement down, going down each site, you can see that this is the final data. There's still lots of areas in which we can improve. And if you look at it from a quality polygon, if the out, reaching the outsides of the polygon on each measure is high performance, you can see that each hospital is performing well on different areas and we still all have room for improvement. However, if you do um, cumulative sum mortality, observe to expected mortality, take and risk adjust the mortality of these patients, it looks like we have a statistically significant increase in lives saved across the whole project. And we submitted that for publication. So the blue data is the performance as we were. If you're performing better than expected, you go up. Um, and if the patient dies when they're expected to survive, you go down we all improved much more once we implemented this protocol. If you want just the raw data, this is uh, my hospital, and we implemented the pathway where the blue arrow shows. It took some time for the changes to be implemented. We're now sustaining, the final dot is December, and I can tell you that our January and February mortality is 3% and 5%. I've been interested in this, these patients' outcomes for 20 years and I've never seen this before. So in quality improvement terms, statistical process control just on our raw data, we now have a statistically significant change. So what did we do to make change happen? Well, the will, 
Just as I've showed you the data, we told the story of where we are now, creating the need for change. Ideas we stole shamelessly for, from each other and from other centers. We, we took their ideas and made it happen for patients. We innovated, we standardized our pathways, we made it easy to do the right thing, we fed back and celebrated success, something particularly in the English NHS we're not very good at doing. We measured constantly and fed back, and we shared results across the four hospitals regularly and learned from each other, so speeding up our learning. So things like giving a standardized protocol, so in the middle of the night, your junior doctor that's not familiar, they're basically told exactly what to do. Give ownership to enthusiasts, get people on board who are going to help you, and don't fight the laggards. We heard about sustainability earlier. They will come on board when they see these changes happening. So what else can we do? Well, I think we need to think about the time. This is a, a paper from 2003 showing the temporal patterns of post-operative complications. And although we're trying to admit most of our patients to critical care beds, they're probably only going to stay one to two days, and yet, as we saw with our eight-year-olds, they're going to get their AF on day two to three, heart failure then, respiratory failure then, and renal failure. So we need to be looking much more proactively across the, these patients' course for the problems and anticipating them. And that can be done really simply with, again, using things like early warning scoring, just keeping a high index of suspicion that these patients are going to get into trouble when they're back on the ward. You've heard about um, proactive care for older people. I think in these emergency patients, many of them are elderly, they've been septic, they're really very high risk. And so getting um, care of the elderly physicians involved is one of the next things I would like to do. Some, I apologize, some of you will have seen this slide before from the National Emergency Laparotomy Audit in the UK, but what will improvement look like? At 15% mortality, if we could bring those high outliers down, um, we've got 7,500 deaths. If we can bring the best 25, if we can get that mortality to the best 25% of hospitals, we save 3,750 lives. If we can get to 5% mortality where we currently are in Bath for everybody, we'd save 5,000 lives. So 5,000 lives is one and a half London buses per week in the UK of patients. What else are we doing? Um, we have funding, uh, NIHR funding for 1.5 million pounds um, for a big study looking at perioperative quality improvement for high-risk patients, uh, led by Rupert Pierce, who many of you are familiar with. I'm the quality improvement lead and we're basically trying to get people using basic quality improvement me methodology, feeding back, and seeing whether we can replicate some of the things we've seen in Elpquick across 90 hospitals. As Mike finished with, I'm going to finish with sepsis. This is a story which, you know, the names, the dates, the details have been changed, but I would challenge you that this sort of thing couldn't happen in your hospital. A 68-year-old lady admitted as an emergency surgical admission with acute abdominal pain, arriving at 11 o'clock. She had her observations carried out, but they were very busy, and an early warning score wasn't added up. She was first seen by a junior doctor, a very junior doctor, at 2 a.m. She appeared more unwell, but a repeat set of observations was not performed until 4 a.m., and the respiratory rate and conscious level were not documented. The next set of observations at 8.25 showed her to be tachypneic, tachycardic, and hypotensive with an early warning scoring of six. The team swung, swung into action and a blood gas was taken which showed severe metabolic acidosis. She had an emergency laparotomy two hours later which showed a gastric perforation and peritonitis. She required extensive support on ICU for multi-organ failure and subsequently died. So, the point of that story is it doesn't matter how good we are at our pathways, how good we are at our surgery and our critical care, if we're not picking these patients up as they come through the door, people aren't thinking about sepsis, they aren't thinking with urgency, then we've missed the boat. Some data from Scotland um, from patients presenting to um, emergency departments in Scotland. 
Only 71% had an early warning score done, so we're not alone. 34% of those had severe sepsis. Only 21% had blood cultures. Only 32% who needed it got IV antibiotics and 70% IV fluids. So the defect in that study was 18 to 74%. So we all have room for improvement. So finally, I would say improving emergency surgery requires reliability and standardization of the care pathway. Reliability meaning that we think about sepsis, we give the antibiotics, we do the goal-directed fluid therapy, even though it's 3 o'clock in the morning. So I would suggest this can be done, and early results show improvement, which may be significant. Standardize the pathways of care. Don't forget teamwork and communication, very key with emergency surgery patients, and create this sense of urgency. And as Don Berwick at IHI said, reliability means keeping promises to patients. I think all those things add up to ERAS for emergency surgery. So finally, some words from William Forster. Quality is never an accident. It's always the result of high intention, severe, sincere effort, intelligent direction, and skillful execution. It represents the wise choice of many alternatives. And I think that we can do quality improvement for emergency surgery and make a difference. Thank you. Thank you.